Okay, uh, thanks very much for coming along. Um, hopefully we're all here for squash bugs with static analysis. Uh, my name's Dave Lidemans. And what I want to convince you by the end of this talk, if you're not already convinced, is that appropriate application of static analysis uh, will reduce the overall cost of our software development. And the way static analysis can help reduce the cost of overall um, software development is if we imagine how much a bug costs. Generally, the later we find it, we've probably seen graphs like that, the longer a bug festers um, in the system, or the later it is we find it, generally the higher the cost of fixing or rectifying that bug is. So what we really want to do is take expensive bugs um, at maintenance level and push them all the way down there and potentially not even introduce them into our code base in the, first, in the first place. So if we can do that, then we reduce cost and we're going to see how static analysis can help to, to do that. Um, there's lots of great talks going on right now, so I just want to make sure you're all in the right room. Um, if you don't use stat any static analysis or any basic static analysis and you want to find out more about the advanced tools, this, this hopefully is the place for you. Um, but if you're already using powerful IDEs and you've always, already got things like SAM and um, PHP STAN in your CI, then maybe you want to try, try somewhere else. I shan't be offended. Okay, so our agenda, it's basically my story. I'm going to go from where I was doing no static analysis at all to reasonably advanced static analysis and kind of take you on the journey. And hopefully, wherever you are on that journey, um, you can move along to the, to the next step of your, of your static analysis journey. Um, but before we start, we'll have a quick discussion about static analysis and, and how it differs um, from testing. And who is, is telling this story? Uh, me, my name is Dave Lidemont. Um, I work for a small software consultancy called Lamp Bristol in the UK, help organize a couple of meetups over there. And when I'm not doing um, uh, coding related stuff, you might find me running or scuba diving, and that's, that's me in the, in the silly arms. But enough of that, we're here to learn about static analysis. So static analysis is looking at the code and reasoning as to whether it is correct, or whether actually whether there's potentially an issue with it. Um, so we're all going to do some static analysis now. Um, is this code correct with all the available information we have? So let's have a look at it. Um, we're assigning A an integer value 1. We're then calling process passing A, uh, which is integer value 1, uh, to, the, to the function process. And we can see the process takes, um, sorry, double click there, uh, process takes um, uh, something called user. But we have no more information about that. So as far as we can see, with all the available with all the available information we have here, this is probably valid. We'd have to go and look at what's going on inside process to decide if that was not the case. However, how about this code? Here we're starting off the same. We're giving a an integer value one. We're then calling process passing a to it. And we can see here that process is expecting a user object. So the fact we're passing an integer means that if we ran this code for real, we would get uh, a type error saying, I'm expecting user, I've been giving an int. So if we ran this code, this would definitely fail. And this is what static analysis does. It tells us that our code is incorrect. No amount of static analysis can tell us that our code you know, is, is functioning correctly and doing what it's designed to do. It just nags us and tells us things are wrong. Whereas tests are kind of the opposite, really. Um, imagine we've got some really simple code. I make no apology. I just want the code to be simple, so it's already 4 o'clock. We don't have to think too much about it. And hopefully the people at the back can read it as well. Um, it's a pretty simple method. Uh, it's get price. We give it a type. It returns an integer. Um, if type is child, we set price to 10. Uh, if type is adult, we set it to 20. And finally, we return price. So. If I wanted to test that, we've got some really simple test cases we do. Test case one, uh, we input child, we expect the output to be 10. Test case two, we input adult, we expect the output to be 20. Um, no great surprises there. And if we run those tests on this, on this code here, all our tests would pass. And interestingly, if we ran the code, uh, we ran our test on the code as it is written here, we would also have 100% code coverage. Every line would have been executed. And also, every branch, every if statement will have taken both the true and the false branches of it. So tests tell us for the particular scenario we're testing that everything's working correctly, assuming, of course, the test passes. 
So what we do when we're writing a test suite is we hopefully do, do relatively sensible testing. We think about the happy path, we think about the edge cases, and then with all these tests in combination, we say, well, we're pretty confident that everything's working correctly. But we've only tested the scenarios in those test cases, nothing else. So if we gave the same code to static analysis, it might whinge about it. It might say, well, there's a chance that price is undefined. We've got a possibly undefined variable, because if we pass in something that isn't child or isn't adult, then we get to the return statement and price hasn't been set. So price will be null, and then when we try and return something, our contract with whoever is calling get prices will return an integer. We're trying to return null, um, so we'll get an, an issue there. So essentially, static analysis tells us we made mistakes. Tests tell us for the scenario we've tested, everything is working correctly. So that's our, that's our prologue. Now, now we're ready for, for my story. Um, a bit of confession time. The first PHP code looked very similar to this, um, which is pretty, pretty awful code, really. Uh, it, was, it was a long time ago. It was 2005. And not only was my code, I mean, 2005, Ajax had only just been invented. You know, it's a long time ago. That's, that's my excuse, anyway. And not only that, um, I didn't have any tests. Well, my testing was basically hitting F5 on the browser and hoping everything still worked. And then the tool I was using to write my PHP code it didn't have any syntax highlighting. It wouldn't tell me of any mistakes I'd made. Um, so that, was, that wasn't great. And also, I didn't have any automated linting, any basic static analysis to tell me I'd made mistakes. And essentially, these last two points, we're checking the same thing. You know, is the code, is the code correct? Uh, and the, the first one, I'm going to call real-time static analysis. If I've got a code editor and it's telling me I'm, I'm making mistakes as I make them, that's kind of real-time static analysis and that'll help me fix or even prevent putting bugs in, in the first place. And then the automated testing is something I'd do as part of CI. So if we think about our cost of a bug, uh, you know, CI can help us potentially take bugs from this expensive maintenance phase and do it to whenever we run our CI. Um, and then our real-time static analysis can take any bugs and potentially make them obvious to us as we're writing the code and potentially even before then. So our first takeaway, I think, is if whatever editor you're using to write your PHP code today, if it can't point out these kind of basic mistakes, like I'm missing a dollar on price, or I'm missing a semicolon here, or I've misspelt return, and it'd be nice if it could also tell you we've got typos as well, and we'll see why that's important later. If your tool that you're using to write code cannot do these kind of checks, then next time you're, then next time you're writing some PHP, think about getting another tool, and we'll, we'll talk about one later. Um, the second thing is you really want some automated um, linting, at the very least, as part of your continuous integration. So these days, I use parallel lint. Um, that's how you install it, and then you just run it, uh, just point it at the directory you want to do uh, your linting on. And while we're on the subject of, of the CI toolset, these are the kind of things that I drop into my continuous integration. Um, only in the last year I've done Compose Validate, which is quite good. It, it checks that your um, Composer JSON is valid, and it also checks that the uh, Composer JSON and the Composer.lock file are in step with each other. So I definitely add that into your CI. Parallel Lint we've talked about. Um, some, kind of, some kind of tool that um, checks that your coding standards are being adhered to. So I use uh, PHP CS Fixer. There's also PHP CS. Do doesn't matter which one you use, but definitely add that in um, to, your, to your CI. Because um, I can be a bit lazy, sometimes I do my debugging by putting var dumps into my code. Sorry about that. Um, var dump checker then goes through your code to check you haven't left any of those in your code. So again, it's a nice little check to, to add into your CI. It's a pretty quick thing to do. Um, the Sensio Lab Security Checker, that's quite a neat tool as well. It looks at your composer files, it works out what packages you've got installed, and then it um, references um, a library of all the reported uh, security vulnerabilities, and then it will let you know if you're using packages that have any of those. 
And in fact, probably the best resource for PHP static analysis on the internet, just Google PHP static analysis tools. I bet this will take you to the, the, the first link. And uh, that page has got like 50 or so different static analysis tools. Have a look at them and start adding them into your CI process. Um, a few more I do. These are definitely in Symfony 3. I haven't moved to Symfony 4 yet. But in a few more linting things, you know, check your YAML's OK, check your Twig's OK, check your doctrine schema's all right. Really quick checks, just add them in, and you've got those checks forever. So hopefully, you're in agreement. Even if we just do those basic checks, and we add them in as part of our CI, and we get a, 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 a PHP editor, which does real-time static analysis. If we just start doing that, we will catch bugs sooner, and we will reduce the overall cost. And all the stuff I've talked about so far, you almost get for free. You just set it up once, and it's there forever. And you can reuse it on all your projects. So that was kind of where we're at the start, from nothing to some kind of relatively basic static analysis. And then I went off and did something quite different. Uh, an opportunity came up, uh, as well as PHP. I was working with Java and uh, C and C++ at the time. And I went off to do a job. Um, this was about a decade ago now, and it was quite a powerful tool at the time, but it was a static analysis tool for Java and C and C++. And my job was to go off to a customer site, um, install the, the, the tool, run it through on their code base, and we'd have a long discussion as to what it would found and, and whether they could live with, without this amazing tool we were trying to sell them. Um, and a great deal of time was spent discussing um, what is a bug, and are bugs really bugs? So, Unfortunately, a long time afterwards, I kind of thought there's really four kinds of bugs you get from static analysis tools. There's, there's genuine bugs. There's things if you ran it, everything would go wrong. Then we've got three more. There's deferred bugs, evolvability defects, and false positives. You always get some kind of false positives on static analysis tools. So this is the real bug that we saw earlier. We're basically trying to pass an integer into something that only accepts um, something of type user. That's a real bug. If we ran that code, it would fail. I don't think anyone's going to debate that one. Um, this is an interesting bug. Uh, I need to give you the context, actually. Um, can we see where the bug might be here? OK, we've um, misspelt person. We've inconsistently spelt person. And the interesting thing about this bug was this is responsible. It was a bug like this which um, inspired Matt Brown from Vimeo to write Psalm, which is one of the first, what I think is quite advanced PHP um, static analysis tools. Um, if you just Google finding code that ain't broke by Matt Brown, it will take you to that link. Really interesting read. He talks about some uh, terrible release where everything went wrong, and then they basically had a look at it, what went wrong, and it was because something had been misnamed. And he thought, this is the kind of thing we really should be able to catch with static analysis tools. So that's real, real bugs. If you ran the code, it would crash. Then we've got like this example earlier, and I'm, I'm going to call these deferred bugs. So this code works as long as um, we always give child or adult as a type. And the problem is, obviously, if we give anything else than child or adult, then, then we're going to get in, run into trouble. And, and lots of the discussions I had when I was trying to sell this tool to people is you said, well, these things, these things aren't really bugs, are they? And what would often happen is we'd have a discussion. They would, they would go away and have a look at the code. And they say, look, I've looked at the three times we've called get price, and we always use child or, or adult, and that's fine. And it took them half an hour to work that out. And then I'll say, well, OK, that's fine. Um, but do we know from now till the end of this project that we'll always call get price with just those two values? And you, you just don't know. So often, it's quicker to fix these bugs than to risk them, I think. So the third kind of bugs, they're evolvability defects. And an evolvability defect, uh, I'll read this out, it's code that makes the code base less compliant with standards, more error prone, or more difficult to modify, extend, or understand. So it's a posh word for technical debt. Um, and people have studied evolvability uh, defects. Um, they 
cost a lot of money. There's, there's some links to some articles uh, that, if you get the slides at the end, there's the slide at the end which, which shows all the references. So if you are having arguments with people about technical debt and whether it should be addressed, here are some studies where they've actually kind of put figures on these things. So like 28% longer to develop new features on code that's lower vulnerability and fixing bugs takes 36% longer. Now, as developers, you will know this, um, but sometimes you need to back that up with like, real facts and stuff when you, when you go off to management. So um, have a look at the slides at the end and, and, and have a look at those uh, articles. So a kind of really simple evolvability defect here. We, we say in the dot block we're returning an int, but actually if we look inside, it doesn't look like an int to me we're returning. It looks like a string. Now probably this code is functioning, abs functioning absolutely fine, but at some time in the future when we want to make a small change to this, it's misleading. That dot block is misleading. Um, we don't have any return type on the function. It will cause trouble. People will be a little unexpected if they read this uh, and to see that essentially we're turning a string instead of an int. So, and there's also false positives, um, which aren't really bugs, but everyone kind of agreed that the first set of bugs were bugs, and then I'm going to say, look, the next three sets probably are bugs, really. There are going to be some costs there. And even the false positives, often, once you get to understand your static analysis tools, you can do, you can do your static analysis, in a, you can write your code in a different way, which won't trigger the static analysis warnings, and often that's a clearer way of doing it anyway. So arguably all of these are bugs, but definitely I think the, the top three are. That said, um, you'll go through and you'll fix all the really critical bugs, all the thing in, in the, you know, the first set, and you still might have hundreds of bugs left, or thousands of bugs left. And when I'm, there I am trying to sell this talk to someone, somebody says to me, well, you don't really expect me to fix 3,000 bugs before we develop any new features. And of course, we don't expect them to, to do that. But this tool had this great thing which you could essentially baseline all your bugs. You could say, well, I've seen these all now, and I only want you to show me, as the code progresses, any new defects um, that have been introduced. So anyway, I did that kind of job for about a year, and it wasn't really me. I, I much preferred programming, so I went back to programming, and these were the three main languages I was using at the time. And I did quite a lot of Java development, and that really influenced how I did my PHP development, mainly in the fact I just type-hinted everything. Even in the days of um, PHP 5.4, 5.5, I put all the type-hints in, in the doc blocks, and my IDE could understand them, and it, it kind of did the stuff you get now with seven, but it, 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 you could do it all back in, in the days of five as well. Um, and currently my idea of choice is PHP Storm, and it can just look at the code. This is, the, this is uh, the, the first problem we had, and it's highlighting the error there, and it's even telling me what I've, what I've made, what mistake I've made. But of course, it's unlikely I'd ever even get into that situation, because um, as I'm writing the code, it even tells me the thing I'm supposed to be passing to process is uh, uh, an object of type user. And also, when I'm, when I'm writing code away, it, because, of all the do, because of all the type hints, PHP understands the code quite well, and it can just suggest, here are all the possible options um, that you can give here. So if we think about a cost of fixing the bug, we're basically taking some bugs, and we're not even going to introduce them in the first place. So. And that's just by doing type hinting and using a good IDE. So here are a list of requirements I think are required for you know, a real-time static analysis tool, an IDE. And it's got to fully understand the code base that you're working on. It's got to report errors in real time. And it needs to suggest an autocomplete based on the context. And something we haven't discussed at all, but it would be good if it can help, help you out with refactoring as well, because we know naming is difficult. We're going to want to rename things. If your IDE understands the entire code base, then you can do things like refactor a function name, and it finds out all the places that you used, and it just changes the names everywhere. So hopefully we can see that doing things like basic static analysis in our CI, use tools, um, Use a good IDE, which does real-time static analysis, and type hinting everything massively helps us. It massively helps us find bugs early and therefore reduces the overall cost. So I was in a pretty happy place. Um, I was using PHP Storm. I, I don't have any association with either of these tools apart from the fact I use them. But I was using PHP Storm, and if you feel your IDE isn't good enough, then just give that a go. 
Um, and I was using Circle CI to run all of the um, all of the uh, CI processes. And again, if you're not doing CI, have a look at something like Circle CI. It gives you something like one and a half, well, 1,500 build minutes free per month on um, close on um, private um, private repositories. So if your code's in GitHub or Bitbucket in a private repository and you don't have any CI, then you can essentially try this out for free. Um, there's a link to a skeleton CI project which shows you how to set this up, like just the very basics. Um, so if you don't have CI, I reckon you could get it going in half a day, and I think it's worth it. But there was still this nagging problem. My real-time static analysis tool was doing really good, amazing checks for me, and those things were not getting replicated in the CI. My CI was relatively basic. And I kind of thought, we just I'm not really happy about this. Um, if everyone on the project all uses real-time static analysis tools like PHP Storm, and they check before they commit their code that there are no bugs or anything like that, then that's fine. But everyone will make a mistake. And often in code, you're changing some code here, and you think you've altered everything you need to for that change to work, and you've missed something over there. Um, and then that might not become apparent until the tests run, or even worse, until it comes out in, in you know, people are using it for, for, for real. So I wanted to replicate those quite advanced um, checks that my IDE was doing in CI. And then about 18 months ago, I was at a conference, and uh, Rasmus was, was talking, and he mentioned this um, tool called FAN. And I had a look at it, and thought, that's exactly what it is. That's doing all the great checks that um, PHP Storm are doing for me, and it's a tool I can run as part of my CI process. So I went and had a look at them, and I, I discovered there's actually three. There's probably more. But the three I've kind of had a look at are SAM, FAN, and PHP STAN. These essentially do the same thing, and they all are fantastic tools. And I definitely recommend you to have a look at any of them. And from now, I'm mainly going to talk about SAM, but what I say about SAM is kind of applicable to all of them. So the first thing you can do, if you want to, is go to the getsam.org homepage, and they have on there an editor, and you can type in the code, and it shows you pretty much in real time what errors Psalm would have found. So if you want to have a practice and see what it does, and, 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 and you put some like snippets of code in, it tells you exactly the kind of problems it would have found. So I definitely recommend you to go and have a look at that. It's, um, it's great to see the power of these things. Uh, PHP Stan has a similar thing on its homepage as well. So there's some common concepts that all of these tools have. Uh, the first is they all have a concept of level, and this is how strict they are in their analysis of the code. So they all have a very um, low level of, 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 of strictness, um, and then as the strictness levels increase, basically you're adding in more and more checks. And the reason for this is so they say if you've got some terrible legacy code base, you put it on its um, least strict level first, you clear up all those bugs, and then, and then you can slowly um, right, raise the level as your, as your code quality goes up. Another common concept um, they all deal with is something called generics. And generics is, is essentially the bit that's missing from the PHP 7's um, type system. So if we look at this code, um, right down the bottom, we are calling business get employees and we're looping through each, each thing in the array that it returns. And we can see we have done a type in here. We have said that get employees does return something of array, so we know we can iterate through it. So we know that bit's valid. But we don't know from the code on the screen what we are iterating through. So we don't know the type of employee. We are then calling promote employee. And we can see that promote is expecting um, uh, the parameter to be of type employee. But given that information that's on the screen, we don't know if that's actually happening. So we can get around this. Um, we can add a dot block to um, get employees. And we said at return, employee, open close bracket. So that means we are returning the thing that we're iterating over, the values of them are all of type employee. And actually, our static analysis tools will look at that, and, and they'll look inside get employees. And if they ever see anything being added to an array that gets returned that isn't of type employee, it will complain about that. So it means that we now know employee down here is of type employee. And when we call promote, we know we are passing an employee object to promote, so we know that that is all fine. 
So that essentially is, is quite basic generics. And even our IDEs understand this. So this is a screenshot from PHP Storm. You see there, I've highlighted a bit of code where we're saying um, the employee's array, you know, employee is the value, in, is the type of things of value in the array. And we can see down there, basically if we hover over employee, PHP Storm will tell us that employee is of type employee. So that's good, but what about a slightly more advanced case here? So now we're iterating through our employees and we're interested in the key and the value. So the key is name in this case and we're passing name to a welcome function and we can see that the welcome function is expecting uh, name to be a type string. So if we took that code as it stood and put it into um, the PHP Psalm thing on the home page, it would look a bit like this. And it's, it's highlighting that when we're calling name, that when we're calling welcome with dollar name, it's saying argument one of welcome cannot be mixed. It's expecting it to be string. So Psalm, basically, when it doesn't know the type of something, it says, well, it's mixed. Mixed could be anything. It could be any object or um, any scalar type. So Psalm is saying there's a, there's a chance what you're passing to welcome isn't a string. I don't know. I can't work it out. It's type mixed. So if we go back to our code, what we can do is we can do an alternative way of specifying what we're returning from get employees. So we're doing at return and we're saying array, open angle bracket, string, comma, employee, close angle bracket. And what that means is the key in the thing we're iterating through is of type string and the value is of type employee. So that means we know that name is of type string and that means we're, we're passing a string to the welcome method and that's what the welcome method is expecting. So that's all great. But the problem is, currently, PHP Storm doesn't understand this, although I think that is going to change soon because they've recently released something which hopefully will understand this kind of thing. And the problem is that that means when I'm looking at employee, it's, it's now telling me it's mixed. It's saying, I don't know that's, that's an employee. So I've lost a lot, bit of functionality here um, in my real-time IDE, which is a bit of a shame because it means I'm going to find bugs later. I want to see problems as, as, as I introduce them. So there's a way around this, which is common to some of these tools I've talked about. You can, as before, specify the return type employee in the old way, and that means the static analysis tools like PHP Storm know that the values are of type employee. And then we can do Psalm return, and this is a message only to Psalm that says, look, ignore whatever else you've been told about the return type. This return type is an array where the um, keys are of type string and the values are of type employee. Now, it, it would be a bit of a pain if we have to do this everywhere, but in most cases, we don't really care about the type of um, the key and the thing we're iterating through, in most cases. Uh, in, in other good news, uh, PSR5 um, has kind of been resurrected, and they are also advocating um, this form for generics as well, or as one of, the, one of the forms for generics. So when that gets accepted, if it gets accepted, when it gets accepted, all the tool vendors will hopefully come on board and um, understand that too. So, yep, you can have varm, fram, and return, and there's sum, and there's um, fan variations of that as well. Other um, concepts is we've got quite a lot of control about what um, it looks for, what it finds. So, you can set levels, and obviously, as you increase the severity levels, there'll be more and more checks, but you can, on all of them, say, look, ignore this kind of check. Um, you can do things in the config, like, say, ignore certain directories or, or turn off all of those type of errors. And you can annotate the code as well. So um, you can, say, suppress this particular issue. So hopefully, you're kind of inspired now. I want to try out SARM. Is it easy to do? It's really easy. We just uh, installed it like this. Um, and then all of these things have basically a config file which tell them what to do. And if you run some in it, it will generate the config file for you. You tell it the directory of the code you would like to analyze and the level you would like to analyze it at. And then you just run some again, and it does all its analysis. And then you're probably going to cry at the results as, as I did. So um, I had some code that I've been working on at work. Uh, 
been a couple of us working on it. Um, it was reasonably well tested. It was developed using PHP Storm, and we were pretty good at you know checking we hadn't left any any problems in there. And um, we did code review as well. So it was, I thought, reasonably high level. I thought they won't find much. Um, and this is what Sam found at each of the levels. So at level eight, its least strict level, it still found 30 issues, going all the way up to one and a half thousand at its most strict level. So that was an upsetting day. Um, but I looked, and it, they, they did find some really useful bugs. Um, so this is an example of a, a real genuine bug it found. Part of the system, uh, we have some, far, some data stored in JSON. We convert it into a PHP array, and then we loop through it and pull out bits of it. And one of the bits we pull out is um, an email address. And get email address is expecting a return type of string. So kind of like, let's work it back. We're returning dollar email. And we see that we're getting dollar email by pulling something out of the array. And we do have a check of sorts in there. We check that what we're getting back uh, isn't empty. And if it is, it throws an import, ent en import ent entry exception. And that was caught later up and, l and higher up in you roughly how far the JSON document we were. So it could give a sensible error message, you know, say we've got a problem with you know, this entry of, of the JSON document. But the problem is, what if instead of a, a string for the email address, someone had put seven in or something like that, or, or true or false, something that wasn't a string? What would happen here is we'd get a type error because. Um, Email would say be an int, and we're trying to return an int when we actually said we'll return a string. And a type error wouldn't be a great exception because it would just say something like um, expected string got int. How does that help us find out what's wrong with this with this document we're trying to parse? Um, there's also um, quite a few deferred bugs we found. Um, so here we're trying to we're calling something called create search term. We're passing to it um, a postcode and, and a slug by the looks of it. And we look at the method signature for create search term. It's expecting a postcode and a string. So if you look at the second parameter, we are passing um, location get slug. And if we look at location get slug, we're saying we return a string or null. So we're returning something that's a string or null to something which only accepts string. So there is a chance maybe we can get into a state where location doesn't have a slug set. I don't know. I'd have to go and investigate that. Um, I mean, it appears to be working. It's been working for the last year. We do check the logs. We haven't had any issue like this pop up. However, if we go on to extend the code when we're commissioned to do the next bit of work on this, we want to start looking at these deferred bugs because these are the kind of things that might catch us out. I and mean, if we have no idea how slug even gets into the system, well, there's lots of ways slug gets into the system. We don't know that in every time there will be a non-null value there. Um, I also learned something doing um, the re review of the errors. This is an evolvability defect. I, uh, can you actually read that at the back? Um, hopefully. Um, there's an issue here. Can anyone see what potentially the issue is so in terms of aiding understanding? We've missed a return type. I did well. I didn't think about it. I've, I've, anonymous functions. I've never given a return type on an anonymous function. But then I saw this. I thought, oh yeah, you can do it. So I learned something new. Um, however, there were still one and a half thousand bugs, and I'm not really going to go around and fix all these bugs before we do any more development. So here were some tips to kind of focus our static analysis on what's what's important. The first is basically target uh, our business logic. Have people heard about things like hexagonal architecture and layered architecture? OK, so with layered architecture, what we're, what we're talking about is the inner layers know nothing of the outer layer. So the business logic, which is all our core business logic, all the clever stuff that, that makes us money or makes our tools productive and useful, that ideally will know nothing about the world it sits in. It, doesn't, it shouldn't know what framework it's in, whether it's Symfony or Laravel, or whether it's serverless or whatever. It shouldn't care. It knows nothing of the outer world. And equally, our framework knows nothing about the world it sits into. Is a real user talking to it? Is some test thing talking to it? Shouldn't care. But we want to focus all of our strict static analysis just on the business logic. You know. Certainly, if we're using frameworks that everyone's using, a, a lot of those issues will have been picked up and, and fixed. So we can kind of trust the frameworks are reasonably good. Um, and then we can apply like a, a less strict or, or maybe not even bother um, 
uh, looking at the interaction between the framework and our business um, logic. So yeah, focus it on, on, on where all our high value business code is. Um, another problem we had um, was with certain third parties we were using. So we were using this um, tool that created like hashes, like five, six digit um, uh, hashes of whatever you gave it to it. And the, how we were using it, we were calling in code and we were passing it the ID of the entity. So our URLs, instead of being slash, you know, person slash and then a number, it would be person slash and then like a five or six digit hash. So it's harder for people to kind of guess what the next, you know, the next number in the sequence is. So we always called in code um, passing an integer, but if you, if you look at the method signature for the encode thing, it, it almost looks like it doesn't take any parameters at all. So the static analysis tool said, well, there's something doesn't look right here. Um, in reality, you can pass any number of um, uh, parameters to encode, and it just, it just encodes them all. But, and we were using this quite a lot, so instead what we did is we created a, a wrapper, so called clean hasher, and it just wraps the actual hasher function, which will inject, say, by di. Um, and then this is the only point in the entire code base where we get the violation saying, um, you know, you're trying to pass in um, uh, an ID to something that doesn't accept an ID. Um, and then we can either just annotate that to ignore it or just exclude all of these kind of adapters from our static analysis anyway. So then when we actually call it in our code, our static analysis tool is happy with that. Okay, so further static analysis tips. Um, imagine we have a class foo, unimaginably named. All we just need to remember is there's a class called foo and it's got a, a single method called say hello. We've got our DI container. So what we're doing with our DI container is saying, build me something of this, and all we can really do is pass in a string um, that represents what the, the, the class, that we, the, the object we want to build. And for the return type, we can't really be that specific about that because it can build almost anything. Um, so the problem is, when we then use this, we're saying, make me a foo. Our DI container will go and make us an object type foo and we know we can read this code and we can say well I know that the variable foo is of type foo so I know that this is valid I'm calling the you know say hello method um, on foo but our static analysis tools aren't quite that clever yet so there's a few ways we can help them out first thing we can do is we can actually just put like a an out of our you know type foo for dollar foo and then our static analysis tools knows that dollar foo is actually an object of type foo so we can start doing this and this is quite helpful and if you're using php storm or equivalent tools you're probably doing this quite a lot anyway for the places where um, you know it's not obvious what the return type is but there are problems with this um, so when we're calling our DI container, we could either do something like foo colon colon class, which would be my recommended way of asking um, uh, a DI container to build uh, an object, or you could just give it the string representation of that. But the problem with the string representation is you might get it wrong. So let's say actually foo doesn't live in the namespace my app. Um, and again, in, in Psalm and others will have different ways of approaching this. What you can do is you can do this app from psalm thing and have this thing called class dash string so it's saying i'm expecting a string to be passed in but that string must map to what would be what is a valid name of a class so what happens then is when uh, psalm does the analysis it looks at it and it goes um actually that string does represent a class so that's kind of an, an, a nice thing to do um what is our problem here Okay, so what we're trying to do, we're trying to build a bar, except we've annotated our code rather confusingly, saying um, it's actually foo is actually of type foo. So it's probably some kind, kind of cut and pasting. But the problem here is our static analysis is going off thinking that dollar foo is actually an object of type foo, but when we run the code for real, um, we'll actually it will actually be a type bar. So. Again, static analysis can leap, well, Psalm can leap to, our, to leap to our help here. And this is kind of a more advanced kind of generics. 
So what we do is we say we've got this template and we're going to call it T. It's just kind of a convention that templates are, are T. So at the time of writing, we don't know what T represents. We're just saying it represents something. Um, and then we're saying, well, at, at the stage we know this, T will be whatever class name is. So if class name represents an object foo, then T is foo. If, if class name represents bar, then T will be bar. And then we can do sum return type T. So that means at the time we've written this code, we could be asking our DI to build any object, but when Sam looks at it, it goes, right, you are asked me to build an object bar, therefore I'm returning an object bar, and therefore it will complain about that code at the top there. And the other tools, they'll be able to do similar things to this as well. Um, oops. Uh, the bit where you've got the at psalm return and the at, yeah. So at return mixed would be what everything else sees. Now at psalm return, psalm will go, I'm going to take that and I'm going to. Basically, if psalm sees something that's psalm return, it will basically it will understand that and it will ignore anything else. The same if you've got at psalm pram or anything else like that. Yep. Ah, oh, right, this one here, yeah. What it would do then is it would complain by saying it would actually, it's a good question, I think, I'd have to double check, but I'm pretty sure it would complain here and saying that foo, um, you said it's of type foo, but we're returning, we're trying to assign bar to it. Um, but that is the kind of thing, I go to the psalm, website and type it in and, and check what it does, but I'm pretty sure that's what it will do, but not sure enough that I'd bet you a pint on it. So, <laughs> um, Right, but I, generally it's quite good at those kind of things. Okay, so another kind of thing, let's, let's imagine we've got um, a logging command, it's kind of following the command pattern, we construct it with whatever information we want to log in to, we would then dispatch it off, something would execute this command, and then assuming it executed success successfully, we're going to call the get access token to get whatever the token is for the thing we've logged into. Um, and I'm going to assume that the access token is only set up, or it's only, um, yeah, it's only set up during the, during the execute phase and nothing in the construction phase. So the problem is, if we do something like this, like we create the command and then we immediately call um, get access token on it, and we look what's kind of going on behind the scenes, probably access token isn't um, set up. But actually, before we get to that stage, Psalm will actually whinge about up here. If we're basically saying access token is of type string. So unless we set access token to something of string during the construction phase, um, there's a chance, well, that, that if we don't set it up in a constructor, then access token will be null. So the first thing Sam Winch is about is this saying, well, this, this is uh, potentially uninitialized. So the way you get around that is you say, well, it's either a string or it's null. Because actually, you can have a constructed um, object where access token is null. So we have to put that there. Um, but then we do this and we're saying, well, we're returning access token, which is of type string, but the problem is access token could be string or null. So the code as it stands, there could be some kind of um, potential uh, type error because we're returning null and it should be um, string. So we can get around this by adding some more code in here um, because essentially we shouldn't be calling get access token until after the command has successfully executed. And to call get access token if the command has not been excessively ex has not been successfully executed is essentially a logic exception. It should never happen. So that's what logic exception means. There's a coding error in your code. Unfortunately, Sam is clever enough to look at this and go, okay, that's fine. I know there is no way that get access token can return anything other than string. So because we put this in, Sam looks at it and goes, yep, that's cool. We have no problems here. 
Um, and maybe we do this quite a lot, and I go, we've got quite a lot of very similar checks, so actually, why don't I replace them with like an assert, not null? And if our assertion method, so this is basically doing the same thing, it's saying, I want to make sure that access token is not null, and if it is null, I'll have some error saying, you probably should have executed this command. Um, so let's say our assertion method looks something like this, pretty simple really. We're passing in an expression, and if the expression equals null, then obviously something's gone wrong, so we'll throw an exception. Yep. And then we go, well, we're not just going to have a not null exception. We're going to have loads of exceptions. Um, so why don't we change our code slightly? So just to make it a bit easier, um, our not null will now look like this. So we're basically asserting that it's true that our expression is not null. And then we've just got this one place where we basically say, OK, if, if this isn't true, then we're going to throw an exception. Because if we've got lots of exceptions, that's quite a streamlined way of doing it. You know, it's just, it, each exception is essentially a one-liner then. But the, the problem with doing this is this at, this at the stage where it's probably getting a bit too much for Psalm, as it stands, to currently understand it. And I think all the others as well. Because Psalm looks at this and because it doesn't go in and then go and work out what happens in the thing that it gets called, it just goes, well, as far as I can see, this doesn't do anything. You know, this, you know if, ex if expression is null, well, well, so what? So actually, Psalm will then complain about this. But you can tell it a bit more about the behavior. You can do this Psalm assert thing. And what this means is you're telling Psalm that this method here, this uh, method here, um, asserts that expression is not null. And you can do it for anything. You can say, I can assert that it is null. I can assert that it's a string. I can assert that it's a type foo. So just by adding this, it's just an extra bit of information that unfortunately we as humans, we can look at it and we can understand what's going on. But actually, you need to help out these static analysis tools. So you might say, well, that is all very well, but I don't write my own assertion libraries. I don't write my own DI containers. We can't realistically expect all of these third parties to go around and litter their code with um, like assertions just to help SARM out, can we? Um, and again, um, each of the tools handle this in a different way. Some of them you write plugins. SARM, you can do this thing um, with stubs. So we create a file um, called stub slash asserts.php. And in it, um, so let's say I'm trying to give more information about Web Mozart's assertion library. So I copy the namespace exactly as it appears in, in, in Web Mozart's um, assertion library. I copy the class, and then I copy the method signature, and it's just empty body. And then I give that information to say that, by the way, Sam, I, this is asserting that that value, that value is not null. And I can do this for any number of these things. I can, I can add in all of, all of the assertions. Um, I can add in my DI containers, I can do all these things, but have as many stubs as I want, and I just put them in to um, the config, and then uh, Sam understands it. And then it now understands what some of these third parties are doing. And as I say, the other tools handle this in a, in a similar way. So basically, you run through your code, um, you, look at the, you look at the outputs, and the first time you run it, you'll see loads of things that go, right, now I understand what's going on. Maybe I have been a bit sloppy there. Yes, in future, I'll sort that out. Um, I'll sort out all the critical bugs. But basically, look at what it's telling you. Learn from the mistakes. So things like I learnt that you could put return types on anonymous functions. I shall do that forevermore. Um, remember to type into everything. And at the places where you need to help out these tools, either use plugins or use stubs, or just to give the static analysis tools a little bit of information that we clever people can understand, but the static analysis tools aren't quite there yet. That is all great. That's all amazing. I do all that stuff, but I still have lots and lots of these errors. And a lot of them aren't really issues that I need to worry about. Um, maybe the integrations with third-party libraries or something like that, and maybe it's too much effort to separate out my code neatly so all my business logic's in one place and everything that connects with it is elsewhere. But I know what I'm doing now, and from this day onwards, I don't want to make any more mistakes like that. And what I really wanted was, I just wanted the ability to baseline my static analysis tools, uh, my static analysis results, just like that tool that I used to sell could do. And 
I couldn't find anything that really did this for me. So in the end, I kind of had a go at writing something. But what happens is we have um, a point in time where we have all of our all of the issues that it's found. It says, here are all the problems. And I go, that's great. I've looked at them. I've solved all the ones I'm going to solve for now. I just don't want to see them in the future. And then we go on in time. We write some more code. We've got a whole load of more problems. Some of them were the previous ones. Some of them we fixed. But we've introduced a new one. And I just want to see what that new one is. So um, it's not quite ready to open source just yet, but it will be soon. It's on video, so I have to, have to, it will be there in the next couple of weeks, I promise. And I'm on video saying that, so I'll have to do it now. Um, if you look at GitHub or follow me on Twitter, I'll tweet when it's out. Um, but basically, it will support um, some, of these, some of these tools we've talked about. And you can actually go and write in. You know, it doesn't even need to be for PHP. It can be any, any, kind of, um, any kind of static analysis tool. You can just write your own kind of uh, analysis thing for it. Um, and how it works is we would take our code, we'd run, say, SARM on it, we'd get the results, and then we call SARB, create baseline, and we'd say, look, here's where the current results are. This is where I want you to save the baseline. And it will say we've created a baseline with 328 problems, say. We then go on, do some more coding. We get the latest set of results, which probably have even more issues in them. Um, so we run SARM to get the latest set of uh, results and then we run SARP saying remove the baseline results again we tell it where everything is and it says right you just supply me with a file that had 334 problems um, the baseline had 328 and by the way 15 of these 334 problems are new since the baseline and you go right those are the 15 I'm going to focus on because then we're just keeping quality where we were when we took the baseline and if you're interested um, kind of how it works is behind the scenes we've got a baseline and it just remembers um, the tool used to create the baseline so in this case SARM um, it, the history marker which is in this case git, uh, git so it would be the git sha of where we were where that baseline was and it goes right here are all the types this is the file and this is where we found them so imagine when we created our baseline uh, we've got a file called person.php and at line 93, we've got this invalid nullable return type. So we then go on, we do some more work, um, we rename person to employee and move, move the file, and we remove 20 lines of code, but we leave in that original issue. But that issue used to be at line 93, but because we've moved 20 lines, it's now at line 73. Um, so then, we rerun it and we say, okay, Saab, so remove the baseline from the results. And what it does is it goes through everything that's been found in the latest analysis result. And it says, we've got this problem. We've got invalid nullable return type at line 73 in class uh, of, of, of employee. And it goes, what was the location of line 73 employee in the baseline? And the history analyzer mainly uses the magic of Git and goes, at the baseline, this was line 93 of person. And then it goes, OK, do we have a problem in valid nullable return type at line 93 of person in the baseline? And we look at the baseline and we go, yes, we do. So we know that this isn't um, a new issue. It was in the baseline. And of course, if any of those steps were false, then we go, OK, this is a new issue. We need to report that to someone. So basically, static analysis with Saab is we run our analysis tool. We decide what we're going to fix, and we go off and fix it. We then run the tool again to create our baseline. And then we kind of repeat forevermore. We write code. We run the analysis. We remove the baseline from the results. And we just fix the things that have been introduced, the bugs that have been introduced. And then hopefully we're happy. So what an adventure it has been. Hopefully. By the end, we can see appropriate use of static analysis can reduce um, the overall cost of software development. And if we use it sensibly, hopefully we can see how we can start reducing costs by using these tools. As a reminder, um, static analysis only tells us that we, our code is incorrect. It is tests that tell us that our code is functioning correctly as per like the requirements. The later we leave a bug, 
the more expensive it is. So a good real-time static analysis can potentially stop us from even introducing bugs in the first place. And then we have the backup of continuous integration for anything we missed as we were coding. Um, this is my CI toolset. I think they're all great tools, and there's a load more here to have a look at. If you're not using CI, just start, start, start using it, and this would be a great starting point. Remember, it's really important to have a good um, real-time static analysis tool, an IDE. I think PHP Storm is great, so if you're not using anything that advanced, give it a go. And once all that's in place, then think about adding um, more advanced static analysis tools to your continuous integration. So that's my story. I've been Dave Hiddeman. Thank you for listening. <laughs>